Good morning, everyone. Thank you for your patience in uh, allowing us to get the PowerPoint set up. My name is Robin Jarofsky Capsam. I'm going to be a panelist and a moderator with my esteemed colleagues, but I want you all to know we're all moderators and panelists tonight, this, uh, this morning. This program is going to be addressing something that has been important for decades and is getting more important day by day because the world is simply getting smaller. And we all know that. Corporations that were small become big. Even if they stay small, they will continue to be doing business cross-border. Whether it's an employee or it's an independent contractor that they have in another region, it has to be managed carefully. And that's what we're all going to be sharing with you today is the tools for doing that. How you can guide your clients in getting through a simple drama to a crisis. Basically, we've got companies that have to cross a border and manage a new legal regime, changing and fluctuating laws, seconded employees, cyber crimes. So what we're going to impart to you today is we're going to start by looking at what are the requirements. What phases do you have to go through when you get that phone call, I got a problem and wrongful conduct in one of my subsidiaries in another place. The second thing we're going to do is we've each selected a scenario and we're going to tell you about practical, real situations with solutions, with balancing the culture, the laws, the company's desire to make money, and how do they not get an employee to maybe quit in the middle of a crisis when you're not really sure who's at fault. And then we're going to share with you some tips, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A, and we want you to participate, and that could be asking questions to anyone up here. It could also be maybe you have an answer to a question somebody asked that we didn't have. So with that, um, i just like to, everyone's going to take a few minutes to introduce themselves. Um, you already have their bios, so we didn't want to take the time away from the substance that we want to share. So let's start from one, one by one, and everyone would just briefly tell you who they are. Hello, everybody. I'm James Tunkey. I'm a chief operating officer of an investigations company called Eye on Asia. Uh, the views that I'm going to express today are my own and not the views of my firm. And I'm going to uh, really talk about a couple of scenarios today that are derived from the over 5,500 cases I've managed uh, at Eye on Asia since joining as a senior partner uh, almost 20 years ago. Thank you. Good morning, Santiago Concha from Colombia. I am the uh, the um, head of the corporate and M&A team, and uh, we advise international companies investing in Colombia. Good morning. Uh, my name is Charles De Monaco. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, as far as my background is concerned, I was a state and federal prosecutor for 22 years, and I was uh, in the district attorney's office doing everything and involved in matters from retail theft to contract murder, U.S. Attorney's Office with Narcotics Organized Crime and then Chief of White Collar, and then in Maine Justice here in Washington, D.C. as the Assistant Chief of the Environmental Crime Section. So in my practice area, um, I'm in white collar criminal defense. It's including internal investigations, both domestic and international, and then civil litigation in both trial and appellate courts. I work with many of the practice groups in my firm, including <coughs> international law, healthcare, Kui Tam litigation, securities fraud, and environmental litigation. This is my 50th year as a lawyer, and I'm, I'm now counsel uh, in our law firm. Every day for me is a new challenge and a learning opportunity, and we hope to impart to you today some of what we've learned over the years. Thank you. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Hiro Tsukamoto. I'm a partner of Kagoshima Born and Sunematsu, a Japanese law firm. And I used to be based in Tokyo, or, but now I am based in New York because Nagashima has an office in New York. And uh, through our New York office, I have been assisting many Japanese companies doing business in the United States and American companies doing business in Japan. And uh, uh, with respect to my background, I'm a dispute resolution and investigation lawyer, uh, and I have been advising uh, Japanese companies in the uh, global uh, investigation, uh, particularly uh, you know, with the United States, because now I am based in uh, New York. Uh, and also, oh, I oftentimes function as a, a local counsel in Japan uh, for the uh, global investigation led by the uh, multinational companies. Happy to be here. <coughs> Um, I'm, as I said, Robin Jarofsky Capsan. I'm a partner at Zahn Law Group, a boutique law firm in New York City. Um, I spend part of my time between New York and South Florida. My background is a little bit untraditional um, because I started as a litigator in New York City in the commercial area for 10 years. Then I spent 28 years between Shanghai, China and Hong Kong, handling mostly corporate matters as a global general counsel. And that encompassed IP, employment, and various other compliance and M&A. Um, I'm back in the United States now, very proudly to say. And with Zan Law, I'm working in the same kind of areas with an Asia focus and a, a global reach. And from that, I get also get involved with a lot of cryptocurrency arbitrations. So with that, I'd like to get started. Um, just want to ask everyone if your phones are on, if you have to work, please make sure they're silent. Um, I may look at my phone, but it's because of time for no other reason. Um, and the fact that my husband was just calling, I'm ignoring it. Um, so let's get started. So basically, this is our agenda. What we are going to do is we're going to start slowly and explain to you the steps that are necessary in order to manage an investigation when that phone call comes, which is, we've got a possible or definite wrongful conduct in our subsidiary. The first thing you're going to do is we're going to address what policies should you have in place? I always say the best way to plan is to know what you need on the back end and have it on the front end. And that's something that Li Feng said yesterday in one of his presentations. Know your end game before you start. Then we're going to handle how can you identify that crisis because it comes in different shapes and forms. We're going to look at what you need for a team, which is what you need for your plan, what you need for the actual conducting of an investigation, and how do you handle the recommendations and implement it. The one thing we've all agreed is that basically this timeline is fluid. And it's fluid because as you go through step one, two, or three, you realize I've got it new fact and I'm going back to the step one or two and they're all happening at the same time. And we're going to share that and let you see it from the actual scenarios that we've all handled. I'm going to turn this over to Charles um, and we're all going to share the slides and we're going to have interactive discussion and I just want everyone to hold all their questions for the end. Thank you, Robin. Uh, what I'm going to cover briefly is the internal affairs doctrine. For those of you who do corporate work, you know this very, very well. Uh, it's important to know the statutory and decisional laws and procedures of the state of incorporation, wherever the issue may be, you know, which governs the operation of the organization and the relationships among the shareholders, the board, and the officers. So you've got to know the lay of the land. That's why this is the first slide. So what laws govern the parent? What laws govern the subsidiary? Well, you have an issue that deals with a parent and a sub. The parent in uh, a country other than the United States, the subsidiary located here in the United States. So what's the relationship of the parent and the subsidiary? So that's a pretty complicated area under the United States law. Uh, in order to hold the subsidiary liable for the acts of its employees, uh, it's through vicarious liability. And so the acts of an employee or an agent uh, acting within the scope of his or her duties for the benefit of the organization gives liability to the subsidiary. 
However, what gives liability to the parent company? There has to be some issue of agency or vicarious liability so that a, an employee of the subsidiary could become a sub-agent, so to speak, of the parent. Um, and it's a matter of functional control versus ownership. Let's say, for example, that there is a foreign company, a company outside of the United States, and for investment purposes, it wants to acquire a subsidiary just for revenue. Uh, and it does so. Well, it might not be exercising functional control of that subsidiary. On the other hand, let's say it's a parent company that wants to exercise functional control, and instead of having a department or a division in the United States, it then, in turn, um, creates a subsidiary, 100% owned and functionally controlled. That could give rise to parental liability. I've been involved in matters in my practice where I had to establish parental liability. And in a situation like that, it's kind of the intersection of corporate governance and economics. Very document intensive where you need experts in governance as well as in economics. So part of the internal affairs doctrine, you've got to know the decisional and statutory law of the state of incorporation. You've got to review the articles of incorporation, the bylaws, the board structure, audit committee and responsibilities, duties and responsibilities of the officers, including authority for expenditure. Um, and they also got to determine is there a corporate compliance program? And does that program address risk areas especially relating to what we're going to be talking about you know, in these various scenarios. And who does that chief um, compliance officer report to? Is it the audit committee um, and the like? That's all part of internal governance. One thing I want to emphasize is the ethics involved, right? What's the ethics involved? Well, the ethics involved is if you're going to be conducting an internal investigation, you're going to want to protect that pursuant to the attorney client privilege and the work product doctrine. You've got to know the law of the state of incorporation as to the privilege that exists. You also got to know what is the law in the parent jurisdiction. Is it the same? Is it similar? Can you keep it confidential? That's the ethical issue for all of us in this room and all of us practicing law that we want to make sure we comply with the rules of ethics and we do so by knowing internal affairs of the organization. And one final point just on this is, as you know, board members as well as officers have fiduciary duties and obligations to the organization. If there isn't a good corporate compliance program, if you don't respond to allegations of wrongdoing in a subsidiary or at the parent, the board itself can breach a fiduciary duty. That means individual board members can be sued. That's all part of the internal affairs doctrine. So we wanted to begin with that, and then we'll get into different steps as to how we conduct an internal investigation. Um, next, we're going to have Santiago um, take step one. But before we do, I just want to comment that the issue of ethics and the attorney-client privilege, we have to look at it from both or all jurisdictions because they're different. Um, in China, you don't really have an attorney-client privilege. You have confidentiality to a client, which has exceptions. The exceptions are if there's an issue of public safety or national security. So you not only have to look at the issues from your own country because they may be very different and influence you in you know, the country where your subsidiary is located. So we want to share with you um, the cases, and we will go after with the cases, but highlight things that you might know and you have lived, but worth highlighting and mentioning again. Um, we need to identify the fire, and how and who does it. Does your company have a whistleblow uh, mechanism? Is it, is it good? Is, does it work? Have you checked it? Um, do, do people use it? Because normally when there is a wrongdoing, when there is something that you need to investigate, it really comes from the inside. The inside source is very important because they are the ones that know what's going on. And we'll see, and we'll see how it goes in the cases. Um, or is it from an external source? Is there any way that the company 
is open for external sources or allowing them to indicate something that something is going on or that something might be going on <clears throat> or worst is it initiated by the government because and I say worse because if it is already in the hands of the government you are in a different position and you need to defend yourself in addition to cure the problem um, <coughs> And as we will see later, when we go over our cases, you need to respond. You need a, a real respond. It is not just a PR issue. You need to change the processes. You need to, let's say, fire a couple of employees, or you need to fire, uh, terminate a vendor. You need to take immediate actions after a due investigation. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to highlight again and again internal affairs doctrine that is, is not only a U.S. issue, but it is worldwide. So we'll see when we see our cases, each of these points uh, being highlighted. Next we're going to have Hero discuss how do you put that team together now that you know you've got the problem. Oh, well, uh, you know, as, as Santiago already explained, um, as a step one, uh, we need we to identify uh, that issue, or we got to identify the fire. And uh, once the fire is identified as a, a step two, we need to set up uh, the uh, good investigation team. Uh, and uh, it is particularly important when we are uh, dealing with not, you know, the domestic investigation, but the global or international investigation, because as uh, Robin already mentioned, uh, there are, uh, you know, all differences uh, in the uh, legal system scheme, let's say, in the U.S., in, in you know, Colombia, uh, in, uh, you know, or China, uh, in Japan. Uh, and, and also, or, you know, or even before all the differences uh, of the uh, legal systems, first, the uh, language is different, and second, uh, the decision-making process is also different, and third, uh, how and where the documents are stored uh, is also all different. And uh, uh, in order to overcome those differences, uh, we need to make sure that we can secure the very good uh, you know, investigation team uh, in each of the jurisdictions where the uh, relevant component are uh, relevant component are uh, existing. And uh, one uh, particularly important point is, uh, you know, or perhaps uh, also again, um, as Robin mentioned, uh, Adoni Clan privilege uh, from the physical perspective. And uh, you know, like in China, uh, in Japan, uh, we do not fully recognize or establish the Adoni Clan privilege protection. Although uh, we do have some, you know, similar uh, protection uh, based on the uh, professional confidentiality or uh, based on some, you know, statutory, you know, or exception to the uh, document production obligation. Uh, but, uh, you know, or we need to understand, the investigation team needed to understand the, uh, you know, or differences, uh, you know, or between or among uh, the, uh, each of the uh, relevant jurisdictions, and uh, that is the uh, reason why, uh, you know, it is very uh, pivotally important uh, for us to, you know, or secure a uh, uh, very competent international investigation or lawyers team from the uh, very beginning. And once we can set up a uh, very good, competent uh, investigation team, then uh, we can move on to step three. <coughs> I just want to add one comment that we have to make sure that when you're putting together the team, not only dealing with the ethical part of attorney-client privilege, we've got to make sure that anyone who is not on a legal team or has a legal commitment, that there's an NDA put in place to protect the confidentiality because if you don't do that, you can end up um, having a situation where you'll have a leak which can cause other problems, including ethical ones. Um, next, I'd like to invite James to discuss the plan. You know, thank you, Robin. You know, when we, we think about uh, putting together a, a plan, uh, there's the old uh, joke that uh, 
culture eats uh, processed for breakfast. And so uh, whatever uh, we're about to say about coming up with a plan, I think has to uh, really be considered in the, in the context of whatever the current culture of the corporation is. So in, in terms of, of uh, who creates the plan, um, it's important to uh, frame what the big picture is. Uh, there, uh, really, history does rhyme when it comes to corporate misconduct. And so if you can have uh, experts around you who've seen similar types of cases before or be able to make uh, good judgments about what this might be, it should not only help you in framing an investigative plan that fits the jurisdiction, but also the typology of the misconduct. And so uh, the first step is really to uh, form a team that uh, together um, it gives its best guess about what the, the big picture really is. And then based on that big picture, uh, to really understand what is known, uh, what is not known, including uh, know yourself, uh, maybe other people on, on site who you don't need to include in the investigation because they are, um, they are part of the problem, and, and to be flexible. So. When it comes to uh, framing the details, often um, you know an investigator will actually be called in first uh, because very little is really known about whether something is true or not, and um, uh, we will get uh, tasked by um, internal counsel, for example, even before uh, the outside uh, team is is framed because there's just not enough detail to really make a determination about whether there's any any problem at all, uh, or uh, a management will come in and say. Uh, but I think that I need to handle this by first understanding what is the investigative challenge here, and then uh, they'll work with their trusted counsel in whatever the local country is. Um, often people will try to micromanage that process. So when you come up with a plan, you need to understand it. Are you being micromanaged? Uh, and so uh, in terms of the details, uh, it's important to understand what are the tasks, what are the, what's the timing of those tasks going to be, what are the stages of the investigation, and to frame out uh, who needs to collect evidence, uh, what, where does the evidence need to be retained, uh, what witnesses are going to be interviewed, what's relevant documents, how do we preserve them, and then where are we looking for it um, in terms of the electronic uh, information. Thank you. Thank you, James. Now, what we're going to look at now is we're going to have Charles revisit not just the internal affairs doctrine, but how is it going to apply to conducting the investigation, which is the next phase? Thank you, Robin. Yes, to build on what James, Santiago, and Hero mentioned, um, now we're at the stage where we're going to be conducting an internal investigation. That's extremely important. Um, the way I do it is I base it on my career in the U.S. Department of Justice. How did I conduct an investigation when I was a criminal prosecutor? Well, I worked with the FBI. Uh, I worked with other investigative agencies. We worked together as a team. And we produce a really good product that can be relied upon to possibly bring action down the road. So that's the way you conduct an investigation. Um, you review physical documents and maintain copies of them. So there could be hard copies of documents in various offices. It depends upon what the allegation is. If it's an embezzlement or mismanagement by an officer or the like, you gather all those relevant documents. As we know, in this day and age, everything is electronic. You're going to have emails. You're going to have electronic documents and the like. you got to have a system in place where you can extract extract those documents um, and then be able to ingest those documents into some computer model that will help you analyze them. It's a very difficult process. Uh, you have to develop a strategy. How do you identify other relevant evidence? Well, we work with very good friends here at Collins who are able to give us predictive models of what other documents would be relevant. That's very important. Um, as James mentioned, we interview witnesses. Well, how do you interview a witness of, um, of a company, uh, there's a ethical issue right then and there that, that we as lawyers need to pay, pay close, close attention to. You know, you probably are familiar with the name of Upjohn, the Upjohn case, the Upjohn doctrine. What that means is that if I, as counsel for a company, 
want to interview an employee of that organization, I have to tell that employee that I am not that employee's lawyer. I am the, employee, I am the lawyer solely of the organization. And what I do, it's called updrawn warnings, I put those in writing. And I give it to the employee, the employee signs it, I sign it, it becomes part of the investigative uh, file. Uh, you could run into serious ethical issues down the road. If the company, for example, says disclose this internal investigation with a government agency, you do so, it implicates a witness, and the witness then says, wait a second, I thought you were my lawyer. How could you reveal that to the government? That's where upjohn warnings come in, and that's an ethical requirement, so that's how I do it. Um, you have to make in, uh, internal administrative decisions. Let's say there's an officer accused of wrongdoing, and there's some credible evidence, as Santiago was mentioning, the credibility of the information. Well, then what do you do? Well, maybe you have to send, suspend that individual. Maybe suspend the person with pay, maybe without pay, depending on the seriousness of the allegations and what you've determined. Uh, those are important employment decisions. And likewise, we go back to the internal affairs doctrine, and then what I do is I engage lawyers in my law firm that have expertise in employment law so that we make the right decisions to give the right advice to the board. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we conduct the forensic analysis. We use BDO quite a bit. And the reason we use BDO in our law firm is because they have offices in many parts of the world. And, uh, and they do a really good job um, in helping us domestically and internationally. That's why we use them. We use others as well. Depends on the nature of the case. And then what we do is we have to periodically update the investigative plan. Think of it like it's an evergreen tree. It's going to keep growing, right? Think of adaptive uh, management. You've got to keep adapting to it because as you go forward in the investigation, you're going to get new information in. You're going to get new documents in. And then what we're going to be able to do is revise the investigative plan so that we can accommodate it. And one last thing, and I really have to emphasize this, at the end of the day, your work product may very well be turned over to the federal government or to a state government. So what do you have to do? to make sure that the evidence is preserved. Well, first of all, you've got to preserve it, so you're going to have the company stop um, and getting rid of any documents. There's going to be a retention of documents, and it will be unlimited until further notice. But the other thing is chain of custody. You've got to preserve chain of custody. That's why I use an agent. And, and the agent takes control of physical evidence and maintains it. So, for example, if I take this legal pad and give it to Santiago, uh, that's the chain. And now Santiago has it. What if we leave the room? He and Santiago leaves. What if we leave the room and this legal pad stays right where it is? And then we come back into the room and Santiago gives it to James. We've just broken the chain of custody. Santiago can't do that. He has to maintain it until he gives it to James. So that's part of the investigation, how we conduct it. Um, and the last thing I, I just want to mention is that... 30 seconds, please. Yes. The last thing I want to mention is that we deal with foreign uh, entities. <clears throat> we have to coordinate the investigation with the foreign company and uh, and that's also part of conducting the investigation because relevant documents can be with the parent not just with the sub so i hope that's of help um, i just want to add that we're not just talking about publicly listed companies what charles was just referencing can apply to a small a startup a medium-sized company and although something may not rise to the level of an FBI or government level investigation or criminal activity you have to approach every investigation with that in mind that it might and one other thing that I want to point out that was mentioned is a concept that we all may be familiar with called the fruit of the poisonous tree and the chain of custody is referencing that if you don't start or at any point it becomes problematic, like going from Charles to Santiago, and that's disturbed, you could have a problem where the evidence is tainted and then you can't rely on it, either for a government formal investigation or even just to fire an employee. 
and they can claim, depending on the, gov the laws of that other jurisdiction, that it's not sufficient evidence. And I know in China, it becomes very problematic if you don't have proper documentation, because oral testimony is not necessarily relied on or considered the best testimony. It's going to be what's written. And so that's why it's very critical what Charles was just pointing out. The next is, what do you do with all of the information we've collected? Um, it's what, are the, what do you do with the results? Well, you can report it and handle it. The one key thing that everyone should know is whatever you do, whether the company is small, medium, or large, public, private, government, family office, you need to document it, which is exactly what Charles was saying. If you don't have a documentation of it, it, when people or the government come back to you in the future, it becomes very problematic. <clears throat> Sometimes it's simply kept at the ownership level. Sometimes you've got to report to a board of directors in a formal report. Um, sometimes you just have to give them a summary. Even if they, the board says, I only want a summary, just stand up and I don't want you to take time with a report. Some clients will say, I don't want to pay you for the report. The answer is, if you give an oral presentation, always have a backup written one in your file in case there's a question that comes up in the distant future. When you're looking at what goes into the report, you've got to make sure that you designate it properly. You can't just prepare a report and hand it off or email it. Sometimes you have to send it because of the confidential nature or the high secure nature of the information in a, in a link. You have to mark it confidential, attorney client privilege, work product privilege. You need to make sure that if it falls on eyes that you don't want to access that information, that they know they should not be looking at it and it should go back to its source. The other thing is, is if you're providing something where there really is complex legal analysis, you then want to maybe push back to a client and say, I know you only want this orally, but I have to give it to you in writing because of the complexity, because I need you to understand this balancing act that's involved. And it may be the balancing act has to do with the inconsistencies between the law of the parent company and the law of the subsidiary region. And maybe you have three or four in a multi-district um, area, multi-jurisdictional region. You have to really manage all of that. Anybody else want to comment before we go on to the next level? Just yeah. one. Casey. <laughs> Let's go. Charles is going to now give a brief comment. Just a, um, a comment on that. The way I do it is I present the findings of the investigation to the board. I follow board direction. They'll tell me, do they want it in writing? Do they want it orally? Do they want it disclosed to the government? Do they not? Do they want to take other action? But that's how I do it. I follow the direction of the board. I think that's pretty good advice. Yes? I have a question. We're taking, well, we'll take this question, well, no, but we're going to take most questions okay, at the very I'll end. Wait, wait, no, but you can. Go ahead. Uh, no, I, I thought you were calling for questions. So, uh, corporate jobs are responsibility. Lots of ethical rules of job and owners. Um, a lot of gray area there. Supposing you represent the board, I mean, it's the basic proposition, but you learn that the board is thinking of some oppressive conduct. Uh, nothing out about right and legal, but maybe vis a vis the shareholders or the minority, they may decide to scuttle a ballot put option, something like that. You know, uh, Could you talk a little bit about that area and, and the things that corporate counsel needs to be, company counsel, concerned about, and at what point do you reflexively pull back? That's a great question, and I think some of what you're going to hear from the scenarios is going to answer some of that. But please, okay. if we don't, yeah. please narrow it and revisit yeah. it. Okay. No, don't apologize. It's a great question, so we'll be keeping that in mind okay. as we're presenting our scenarios. Okay, thanks. Okay? All right. Well, what we have prepared for you is five scenarios of wrongful conduct. Each one of us is going to give you a five minute explanation of what really has happened and these are based on situations we've been involved with. From that, you're going to be able to see some practical solutions that we've had to come up with, how we balance the laws 
the cultural issues as well as the ethical ones. So what we're going to do, we're going to start at the top, the dark government. Yep. So <coughs> this is the fun part. This is what really happened. This is a, an acquisition done by a UK, UK private equity fund through a Delaware company of a Colombian subsidiary. The acquisition was done without our advice, I have to say. The acquisition was done before, six months before, one, one year before, through a UK law firm and American, uh, an American company doing the, uh, the financial due diligence. Once we came into the, into, the, um, into the company to advise the company, we had a management meeting. The client was the U.S. company? My client were the, uh, the U.K. and the U.S. companies. But we were going to advise the regular, the day-to-day -day operation of the company, which was a manufacturing facility. And so we made some, some regular questions. So what are you doing and uh, what are these payments especially? And it caught my eye that I saw a couple of payments related to, it, it said legal fees. So I asked who's this company and they said those are the lawyers in Cali, the city where they were located. These are the lawyers in Bogota. And there were two individuals with, I would say, funny names in Spanish, but let's say it was like Michael Jackson and Charlie Brown. <laughs> they were in Spanish and, and, and Colombian related, but it was Michael Jackson and Charlie Brown. And I said, and do you pay this legal fees to this Mr. Michael Jackson? And it was a conversation with, very formal conversation, very formal meeting, the CEO, former owner, the CFO, the COO, and us. There was a couple of lawyers from our team and, uh, and an accountant, a new accountant appointed by the acquirers. And so they look at each other now. Oh, oh, oh. I said, please, please tell me what these payments are for. And they say, that Michael Jackson is the head of the guerrilla in the zone. So he takes care of the guerrilla not attacking us. And this is in a very dangerous uh, zone of, of, of the country. It was very hot, very, and I mean hot in terms of violence. Um, so they were paying, and this, of course the payments started before the acquisition, way before the acquisition. And so, okay, I was taking notes. And then I said, okay, and who's, the, um, who's this other guy? The other payment. And by the way, the payments were maybe a thousand, a thousand five hundred dollars each per month. Petty cash. The other payment was to the army. So they were paying the army to have them as friends. It was not a formal paying to the army, not to the army of Colombia, but to the captain that took care of the region. So they have security from the government and they have security from the guerrilla. And this is sad, sad for me to say. It was, a real, it was a real situation that was going on all over, all over the, the, the country in many, in many companies. And, and I see back there all of the Latin American firms saying, hmm, this is typical. This, it, it, it all happened in our countries. But it was difficult. Now, and I, I picked this case because of the relation and payment to a guerrilla, relation and payment to the government, but most importantly, all of the ethical considerations of the parent companies in the UK and the Delaware company making the investment. So we had to face UK Bribery Act, FCPA, and the, start, the analysis started with many things. Is this, was this known by the 
country general manager, the, the CEO, who was a former uh, uh, owner, of course, they said, of course. Was this known by the board in Colombia? Yes. Is it documented? They said, no. Well, no, we're not that stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so it was not documented, but they knew. Everybody knew. So now, uh, and I highlighted that it was a UK law firm doing the acquisition because they didn't make these questions. They didn't know the culture. Now it's difficult to make these questions, but you have to. And I highlighted also that it was one of these, the, the American um, big four companies, because they didn't use lo their local company, their local channel, to make those questions or to go, to, go to, the, to, the, to the real stuff and say, who are these guys, Michael Jackson and Charlie Brown? Um, so is this a bribe? <laughs> Paying the army on a monthly basis for them to buy Coca-Cola and sandwiches and maybe t-shirts or something. Is this a bribe? Is it within the threshold? FCPA has a, you, you, you know better than I, but FCPA has a threshold of petty cash payments or something and UK bribery, uh, another one. Would this pass a reputation test? If this goes on CNN, is it something that we can defend? If it goes on CNN London, maybe that's an answer. And the team that we were talking about has to discuss all of this. If this goes on CNN London, is this presentable? If this goes on CNN New York, how would the Americans see it? if this goes on CNN in Bogota or Colombia, would the answer be, okay, that's illegal, but customary? So different questions that, that go on. Now, the other point was the ethical, the liability, the ethical responsibility of the lawyers, because we discovered that just by making a question. We, as lawyers, discovered that. And we had the obligation do we have the obligation? Did we have the obligation? Now that I am informing on the phone, I have to ask before, hey guys, to London lawyers, shall I put this in writing? Should I put it in a report addressed to the board in London? And what do we do with the US? Because the money came from the US to acquire the, the, this, this company. So, I don't want to give you a solution to the case. I just wanted to present it so that we see that this is, this is really what happens. And I picked it also because, contrary to the other cases, the investigation was easy. There was nothing, nothing more to investigate. The payments were done, there was, no, there was no invoices. They were done in cash, every month. So, um, Wanted to, to uh, just, just wanted to bring the case, uh, have it in, in our minds, and as long as we, uh, we continue, uh, we will answer additional questions, and we will, we will find out what we did at the end. Next we have Charles, who's going to talk about the whistleblowing theft. We're going in the order of okay. our ring. Okay, thank you, Robin. Yes, mine will be brief, and as you can see, it's embezzlement, and it is whistleblowing. So, um, so this this happens actually quite a bit in in real life. Mine is hypothetical. I don't want to talk about any given case, but but the hypothetical here would be that there would be a whistleblower at a subsidiary who discovers that there have been some misappropriation by a chief financial officer, uh, that there are payments being made not for legitimate business purposes, but for personal purposes, use of the company credit card for personal reasons and the like, acquisitions of property for personal use, not for company use or the like. And then let's just assume that the whistleblower just doesn't have any confidence to report this allegation to the subsidiary. 
even though the subsidiary has a corporate compliance program. So the whistleblower then reports it to the parent. The parent is in Japan. And so now here is a parent in Japan knowing that there's an allegation of fraud and misappropriation at its subsidiary, and let's say it's in Alabama. So now the parent organization has to make a determination of what do we do? We can't ignore it because if they ignore it in Japan, they'd be breaching the fiduciary duty that they have to their shareholders and the like. Um, and so they can't really conduct the investigation out of Japan into Alabama. The lawyers in Japan wouldn't really be able to do that. They would have to engage a law firm in the United States to conduct that internal investigation in concert with counsel in Japan. Uh, and let's say that the investigation uh, of the <coughs> chief financial officer in Alabama actually is confirmed and that this person did all these things, misappropriated property, uh, obtained an awful lot of money for, for personal gain, and the like. Um, and then let's assume further, this is then reported back to the board in Japan. And at that point, the board in Japan has to make a decision, what do we do with this information? Do we just fire the CFO? Do we report it to the United States Attorney's Office? Uh, because it's a crime for what the CFO did. Why would a parent company want to do that? Well, one reason under the United States Sentencing Guidelines is that the parent company is a victim, as is the subsidiary of the crime of the chief financial officer and would be entitled to restitution. So that's my scenario regarding a whistleblower either going through the chain at the subsidiary or bypassing that into the parent. Those, again, become some of the ethical considerations of how do you keep this confidential while you're doing the investigation in Japan and in Alabama, and you have to have competent counsel in Alabama be involved in that investigation of the conduct of the CFO. So thank you. Thank you very much, Charles. Uh, next, we have Hero, who's going to talk about the scenario dealing with a bogus document or a false document. Oh, well, um, my scenario is logic bogus documents. Uh, and uh, when a company, when a company wants to sell the products uh, in Japan or in the United States or in Europe, and if those products are needed to be certified by the uh, government authority, uh, then uh, it will based upon the result of the uh, test or performance or uh, safety. Uh, you know, or the company uh, may or may not, you know, um, may or may, well, may wish to force buy the uh, test result if they cannot meet the statutorily required standard to sell the uh, products. And that is, this is a hypo. Uh, and uh, if the product is, uh, let's say, a motor vehicle, uh, you know, or you can think about a uh, case similar to the uh, Volkswagen emission scandal, um, uh, you know, or the company may wish to, uh, you know, falsify the uh, test result about the uh, emission uh, test result. Uh, so that they can get, uh, uh, you know, or products or uh, vehicles certified by either government. Uh, and uh, then uh, in, in Japan, uh, that matter uh, should be, uh, you know, or monitored uh, or governed by the Ministry of, uh, Ministry of Land Infrastructure and Transportation, which is basically the Japanese counterpart to the Department of Transportation in the United States. And if uh, the uh, misconduct or if the fire uh, is identified, then uh, the uh, M MLIT, Ministry of uh, Land uh, Infrastructure and Transportation, uh, may wish to investigate that uh, misconduct. Uh, and if even if uh, the uh, products are uh, manufactured in Japan and sold in Japan, if those products are also sold in the United States or in EU, obviously the investigation uh, will become uh, global uh, in Japan, in the US, in EU. 
uh, and uh, Della are two, uh, you know, all things that uh, you know, we, we, I would like you to uh, know or understand as uh, differences uh, between the uh, United States and Japan. And the first point is, uh, you know, as, as we already discussed, uh, the attorney client privilege. And in the United States, uh, we would like to cover our investigation by the attorney client privilege by, uh, you know, involving the counsel uh, from the uh, very beginning. Uh, but uh, in Japan, uh, because we do not uh, recognize the attorney client privilege, uh, privilege protection, uh, you know, or unlike in the United States, although we have some uh, you know, or protection, uh, you know, Japanese companies uh, may not be uh, you know, or aware of that you know, attorney client privilege issue. So, you know, or if uh, the uh, products are manufactured by the uh, Japanese parent company and sold in the United States by the uh, U.S. subsidiary, then, you know, or Japanese company, uh, you know, headquarters may wish to disclose everything uh, to the uh, regulator and also to the public so that they can, uh, you know, apologize uh, for uh, what happened. And uh, we have a, you know, very beautiful culture of apology. And, uh, you know, whenever we, you know, whenever they make a misconduct, we, you know, even if uh, the investigation is not completed, they want to apologize. Uh, but, uh, you know, or as a council or in the United States or uh, in Europe or in Latin American countries, you need to stop that uh, by, you know, or coordinating with the uh, Japanese council. And uh, if your uh, Japanese counterpart uh, is, you know, experienced only in the uh, Japan domestic investigation uh, because of the, uh, you know, or lack of the attorney client privilege protection, uh, you know, or they may, uh, you know, or just, you know, advise that, you know, or the company should apologize to the public, uh, you know, or to fulfill or their accountability to the uh, you know, or society as a good corporate citizen. Uh, and that is, you know, or very typical. So or there is always a tension between the Japanese parent company and the U.S. subsidiary about to what extent you would like to disclose the result of the uh, investigation. The second point, a second typical point is uh, in the United States or in uh, Europe, uh, you know, or you want to explain to the regulator that uh, the company already took the, uh, you know, or remedial measures, including uh, the uh, disciplining or terminating the uh, bad employees who committed uh, the uh, misconduct in the company. And by doing so, particularly in the United States, I understand that uh, you know, you'd like to get the uh, you know, cooperation credit uh, from the uh, Department of Justice and uh, you know, or get uh, a better uh, corporate resolution in the end of the uh, government investigation. Uh, and uh, you know, again, uh, we needed to, and you needed to understand the uh, difference between the legal systems between the U.S. In the EU and Japan, and in the United States, my understanding is that you know, or you can terminate employees or discipline employees relatively easily uh, because uh, the uh, employment is basically at will. Uh, but uh, in Japan, uh, there is no such at will employment thing, and uh, uh, we need to we need to have a um, justifiable reason or cause. Uh, to involuntarily terminate or discipline uh, the uh, employees who committed a uh, misconduct. Uh, and also, even if we can uh, you know, or discipline uh, the employees in Japan under the uh, Japanese labor law, um, the, uh, you know, or the, uh, level, or, uh, the level of the disciplinary action uh, might not be as strong as uh, that in the United States. Uh, but uh, in order to make sure that you know, or you can get the cooperation credit from the Department of Justice, uh, in the, uh, you know, to tell them that well, uh, the uh, Japanese parent company already disciplined or uh, terminated uh, the uh, bad employees who committed a misconduct. Uh, well, uh, you know, or it would be great if you can say that well, they were already terminated, but. In reality, uh, you know, oftentimes, well, we discipline them, but according to the Japanese labor law, we cannot terminate of them. And uh, you know, or we always need to coordinate with the U.S. Council uh, to make sure that you know, or U.S. regulatory authority can understand the difference between the uh, U.S. labor law and uh, Japanese labor law, and uh, understand that you know, or there should be some limitation on what we can do in a foreign country in, uh, like in uh, Japan. And that is my scenario.
Thank you very much, Hiro. Next, we have James Tunkey. He's going to talk about what he calls sideline, and I'll let him un un uh, to release what that means. Uh, thank you, uh, Robin, and a pleasure to be here. Uh, so I'm going to uh, try to keep my scenario tight and understandable uh, and uh, then make a few comments. Uh, before I do, I just want to pick up on something that, that Chuck said earlier uh, and really go and really highlight uh, these categories. Uh, you know, experience does matter. Uh, not every corporate team uh, really has a white collar specialist on their team. And so uh, I think we all have to be sympathetic of our colleagues that they may not have the experience to recognize the patterns uh, and to really quickly get to a point where they understand what the similarity is between what they're looking at and other types of crimes. And so bringing in people early to build out a team uh, to really recognize what are we dealing with, which scenario is incredibly important. One of the things that we see a lot in our practice is this idea of a business being sidelined. Uh, so for example, in a scenario, uh, a U.S. company or a European company uh, invests in an overseas uh, business, makes widgets. Uh, this overseas widget manufacturer uh, has a very strong uh, CEO and local management team. It's what's made them all successful and attractive as a business target. So the uh, widget manufacturer overseas, let's call it local company, is uh, going steady and presents great numbers and there's a transaction and uh, a lockup period for the local uh, CEO and uh, some of the local management team. Uh, along the way, uh, at the first quarter, oh, uh, a few people have decided that they're gonna move on and retire. Okay, some of the local management team starts to disappear, uh, no big deal, uh, and uh, off they go, they're not missed, uh, the local CEO promises that everything's gonna be fine. Next couple quarters are, are pretty soft, actually. The business was supposed to be growing, but the, the business isn't growing. The local business is now starting to uh, to look like a possibly a weak transaction. What's going on here? Well, we're going to trust our local people, and and everything's going to be fine. Uh, then, right before the lockup period ends, a, a few more executives leave. Well, it's understandable. They're moving on to the next step. And uh, the lockup period expires, more weak results, and uh, we now have uh, been uh, e eating a pretty bad transaction. We realize something's going on here. We start to ask questions. The management starts to say, why is this business failing? And uh, the CEO uh, decides, well, if you don't trust me in my business, he announces, uh, I'm gonna leave. And uh, next thing you know, uh, uh, off he goes. And, and uh, you can pick your point of when um, counsel enters this scenario. I would say not yet. Uh, so then, um, oh, uh, the CEO's left and, and we can't seem to find uh, who's really responsible now for uh, signing off on the bank account. And where did the corporate seals go for this uh, local entity? And oh, oh geez, uh, we can't seem to uh, find uh, some critical documents that we need for, uh, for, for running this business. For example, we can't seem to find the supplier lists or uh, our key customer and distributor lists. Okay, that's a problem. Uh, and, oh, and then uh, in this scenario, and it's often frequently in scenarios, we talk about uh, where we get the information from, some local employees start to come forward. And one of our key distributors starts to come forward and say, oh, actually, they've set up a sideline business. And uh, they're making the same product now. And the people that left all the way back at the beginning have actually been incubating uh, our new local competitor. And it gets worse. So we think the CEO is over there. Now, to take this uh, one step further, because this does happen, imagine that the old uh, local CEO is still friendly with lots of your staff, and they still go out for dinners, and the way it gets worse, the CEO decides that he's going to show up with three SUVs on a Sunday night, and the local security team's going to let him in, and uh, key documents disappear out the back of the loading dock and other key computers start to disappear from the offices. Now, how do you handle that investigation? I would say that there's a couple of, of key things. When we talk about uh, an investigative plan, um, and we have to really think not just about the legal considerations, but about the business considerations. Um, and, and here I think it's important to ask just a basic question. Does this require us to fix the airplane while it's 
flying? And if it does, does the investigation uh, require us to work with other stakeholders that we might not otherwise really report out to? Is there critical information that the investigative team is gathering that's going to help us survive and continue to compete in this local market? And uh, that really does present some challenges for the investigation because often there's a desire to hold information back and sometimes management and senior management, even at the board level, needs an update that may may really uh, place some conflicts for how the, the investigation is conducted. And thank you. Thank you very much, James. I've selected a scenario that follows a lot of this investigative plan, and it started with a due diligence of an acquisition by a U.S. company that owned a Hong Kong, that owned a China subsidiary. I was working on the China side. And the question became, should you be buying this company? Why? Well, we, there wasn't a lot of documentation. There were two sets of books, which is normal over there. And we looked at them, and there were so many inconsistencies. We said, from a financial point of view, you need a financial due diligence. CEO said, I don't want to do it. I'm buying it against the recommendation. Two days before we're closing, we get the disclosure schedule which had a new page on it. It's called government corruption. Mm -hmm. They reported an employee that they said might be government but might not. He's a hybrid without getting into the analysis which we did before, of course, pausing the closing said, we really think that you shouldn't go forward. Of course, they did. It's a good deal. And now we're looking to sell again five years later, and it's even better. But the recommendation came with, you must do an internal audit immediately after the acquisition. The question is, what is that going to be? Because we already knew there were problems. But the key thing was, we thought it was more in sourcing. And so that's where it comes to, is this person really getting a kickback? Is the government involved with this? There were so many questions we were asking because they were triggering FCPA um, <coughs> concerns. To then flash forward, the board said, I want the investigation. And we had to keep in mind that the problem may not just be in China. It may trickle all the way up to the US side, dealing with customs, dealing with the operations committee overseeing them in China. So we had to balance it. So the first thing was, we want a secretive team. We had one lawyer in the US, one lawyer in China, and we like Charles pointed out, we gave everybody, even the Chinese staff, the Upjohn warning to make sure they understood that we were doing this to get a better handle on who the company was, who, how they operated, and what we were really doing was looking for inconsistencies in the 20 different employees in both countries who we spoke with. And so we had to be concerned about the ethics, the FCPA, and also balancing it with the labor laws in China because that's not at will. It's very difficult, like Hero pointed out, to fire somebody in China. So with our investigation, we went to and asked the board, what is your goal? So first we got the instruction. The goal was, we want to know any recommendation you have so that we can be squeaky clean, legally compliant. Doesn't mean we're going to listen to you but we want to hear the truth of what we're buying because we know we're taking a risk. So we first did level one, issued a report, gave recommendations of the three people we felt that they should be getting rid of, how they should be getting rid of them, meaning compliant with China labor laws, and then on top of that, who we also thought, we think this person's maybe the ringleader but we don't have the proof. For these other three employees, we have the proof. Then the question is, is that proof sufficient under China law to take an action, or is it under US law? So we had violations of potential ones of the FCPA, but we didn't have sufficient evidence to fire these people under China law. So it became a balancing act of how do we implement it, and then looking at ethical considerations when the CEO says, do you really have to put that in the report to the board? I'll manage it on my own quietly. 
And with that, we then had another conversation with counsel of our ethical obligations and who is our client. Do we need to report that conversation? And so when you're looking at this investigation started for sourcing, we uncovered, as has already been pointed out by some of my colleagues, you don't know where you're going and what other issues you're going to spot. And what I tell people is when you're doing an investigation on X, don't disregard that you have to cast a wide net because you may come up with A, B, and C, and even if we don't want to address them now, you should have a list that you start in the beginning of the investigation, and you put it down so that when the investigation's done, you don't forget them and sweep them under the rug. You actually pick up a second or third investigation. And so from this, we made the recommendations, they started to implement them, and then we got into an employee being a hero, saying, I'm going to take care of getting rid of that person, and went ahead and tape recorded conversations. And then we had to question whether or not that tape recording was the fruit of the poisonous tree. Can it be used in the United States? And we had to look at both, and I call it the ping pong game. We, we compare notes and laws to see, is this compliant? And if it's not, how do we get the evidence compliance? And so you can see how just from one investigation dealing with we think that the sourcing has a problem. We've gone in back and forth, back and forth, and so the timeline is really fluid. So with this, we're gonna go into another phase, and then we're gonna take questions and answers. And so this we're going to go through rather quickly because this is a summary and all of you already have these slides. And so this is the questions that all of us have presented to you of what we've had to ask in order to manage this, you know, how, this type of an investigation. Because of the time, I'm going to yeah. And here we have where, how we can answer some of what we've said. And we want to leave time, we've got another 16 minutes, so we want to go through this in about five minutes and leave time for Q&A, because we know that we definitely have one gentleman here who's waiting to finish off his question. So I'm going to pass this over to Santiago, who's going to kick off this slide. Thank you. Um, due diligence. Let me highlight the due diligence, because it has to be done correctly. I don't know if this is a... a, a motto that I take from IBM or from GM, it is think globally, act locally. You need to have experts doing due diligence so that you understand the business, so that the company really understands the business that they are getting, and the operation in the business. Um, so you need to have the experts locally. And also, after the investigation is done, you have to act rapidly. Let me tell you what happened in this case. They hired a, a consultant expert in handling the communities. So instead of paying the guerrilla leader, which was money just for his pocket, this company started to pay the community as a sustainability program, legally with a discussion with the guerrilla guy, saying, hey, we cannot pay, we cannot continue paying to you. We're gonna pay the community to better serve everybody. But that was done through a consultant that came in and said, you need to approach the leader in such and such way that I wouldn't have done it. Nobody in my law firm would have done it. These are real consultants that do that, real consultants in those terms. Um, so, so be aware of, of due diligence. Due diligence is, um, now that AI is doing due diligence of documents, <laughs> do, do it for documents, that's fine. But for the real operation, make the right questions. Um, and let me finish on the corruption laws applicable to all of these. Um, as I said, it was UK bribery law analysis, FCPA analysis, and local Colombian analysis. At the end of the day, uh, we made them realize that you can make payments to the Colombian army through an agreement. 
So you could legalize that. So instead of the money going to the pocket of the captain, we send the money, or the company send the money to and through to the army through an agreement. They should have known this before. Well, maybe yes. Now they do it. Now they do it, and they they had to 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 make an adequate solution, but fast. Yes, I'll be brief on the next takeaway. It's uh, know the company internal controls and compliance program. Uh, what I want to just emphasize here is that the internal investigation may reveal the need for better control and policies to protect further and future misconduct. So the company will want to revise its corporate compliance program, focus on risk areas, provide uh, training to employees, and by doing so, the board is going to be fulfilling its fiduciary obligation of care consistent with the internal affairs doctrine in the state of incorporation. And of course, it's going to also produce better governance for the organization. One last thing, and that is that if it's a public company, and I deal at times with public companies, then you have to deal with the public auditor for that particular company. And as a result of that, you're going to have to show the auditor there was a problem, there was a correction, policies and procedures were revised, and as a result, now the auditor can feel confidence in its final opinion regarding the state of the organization. So with that, I'll turn it back to Robin. Thank you. I just want to make a quick announcement. I hope that everyone in the back can hear me. As everyone knows, this is a... Oh, sorry. I thought maybe I had a loud mouth. <laughs> um, I just want to make an announcement. This is a CLE with ethics program, and because we had technical difficulties in the beginning, we have to finish at 1239. And so I'm hoping that doesn't burden anyone or inconvenience anyone, and I hope that you will all stay until the very end and participate in the Q&A. This goes to Hero now. Well, well um, I will I will briefly explain uh, that uh, you know one of the biggest mishaps, uh, not appreciating each region may have different laws, regulation, or and uh, ethical requirements. Uh, and as I already mentioned, uh, you know, in Japan uh, there is no uh, established attorney client privilege protection. Uh, and also, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Japan has a, a very good culture of apology. And on top of that, uh, you know, under the Japanese uh, investigation and crisis management practice, uh, you know, or the company, uh, you know, want to disclose uh, the uh, investigation report at the end of the uh, investigation, uh, so that they can fulfill all their, uh, you know, accountability to the society, uh, which could, uh, you know, or which could uh, waive uh, the attorney client privilege protection in other uh, jurisdictions. So, uh, you know, or if you read, if you read the uh, international investigation uh, from the uh, United States, uh, and uh, that international investigation includes Japan or other countries, uh, you know, or where uh, the attorney client privilege protection is not honored or established, uh, you know, from the very beginning, you needed to make sure that uh, your counterpart in Japan or other countries, uh, you know, or that, uh, you know, or they or we should not disclose the, uh, you know, or detailed investigation report to the public. Uh, because, you know, or that will be obviously used by the, uh, you know, or class action plaintiffs in the United States later. Uh, and uh, if you do not do that, uh, and the, if, the, uh, if your uh, Japan Council uh, does not have enough, enough experience of the international investigation, uh, you know, or because of the strong request uh, from the uh, Japanese parent company, uh, you know, or they just you know, or let them uh, disclose the uh, detailed uh, investigation report, or which should be protected by the attorney client privilege. Uh, and uh, uh, that would uh, cause a, a big disaster uh, in the uh, United States later. I'm just going to uh, just point out a 
a couple of key takeaways. Uh, first, uh, on uh, turning a blind eye. You know, we started off with this uh, funny title about uh, smoldering a fire. So it it gives this language of uh, you know trying to put something out uh, and. You know, we've all seen the comedies of, of people trying to put out fires or waiting too long. Uh, and uh, we know that if you wait too long, bad things happen with a fire. And uh, we also know that uh, sometimes uh, bad things happen in a fire and people make the wrong decisions or judgment calls and next thing you know, people get hurt. So, uh, you know, in an investigation, uh, it's really important to uh, to really defend yourself against uh, pressures from the business uh, to turn a blind eye and to remember to act ethically and to uh, take a stand for the people around you uh, to act ethically uh, and to make sure that, um, that people are given proper guidance on, on what their ethical expectations are because they may not have the cultural background or the training necessary to really make good judgment calls in the moment. When, uh, when I look at the, the rest of the key takeaways, again, uh, the only other thing I would say is uh, what's not on uh, here uh, quite expressly is to remember the business uh, and uh, that you may be re required uh, when it talks about doing your homework uh, at every stage to really think about the business. Uh, so for example, in my scenario, I spoke a little bit about uh, how uh, the, the alerts had come in from the uh, the local marketing departments and key customers. And uh, I think it's important to remember that the business might be looking for uh, an understanding of when are the results going to come through and uh, when, uh, when are we going to see an end to this and what's the result. And uh, sometimes people forget that when they go out and they start running an investigation. They forget that they've got other stakeholders who are interested in what the progress is. And that is a part of the homework. Thank you. I just want to end with one thing that everything re references on this slide, which is you have to listen to what your clients are telling you, both their expectations. You also have to sometimes adjust their expectations by reading between the lines. You also have to listen to your witnesses or to the people around you because maybe the instructions you're getting may not be clear or maybe they don't know what the real issues are. And I just want to give a very quick example where not with this particular matter where I had a situation where a forged document was submitted, the company chop was stolen, there was a big problem in the middle of the lawsuit, and I had two employees show up in my office. Not culturally normal. So what did I do? I listened. They sat there for a half hour squirming, and I knew they wanted to tell me something, but they didn't know how. Culturally, it was a very embarrassing thing to tell me. What they were, and they were loyal, they were excellent staff, and what they t said finally when I got it out was, in very awkward motions, that their GM had an affair at their Chinese New Year party, and he was being blackmailed by the former GM that he probably gave them the chop to forge the document because he was a married man, and it was a one-off and he had been drinking. And so I had to figure out how to extract all that, which it took a while, and then how to balance that with how to share that with the client from the cultural and the business perspective, like what James was referencing, and that they didn't want to get fired, and they didn't want the GM fired, even though they knew what he did was 100% wrong. And to flash forward, the, the final decision was they didn't fire him. They took away his power so that he couldn't be bribed again by this other, by the former GM who he replaced. And the GM never knew that the employees told us. And because that was because the parent company management culturally appreciated what it took for them to do this, but that the boss was that good even though he was bribed on a personal level and could have immediately been fired. So with that, we're gonna to go to Q&A, and we just wanna start with the gentleman who asked earlier to see if we didn't, 
I'm talking. Yes. B, see no, if you, there's any follow up, or did we answer your question? Well, I, I have better questions now. Sorry. <laughs> so with Cynthia, and let's try to keep them one at one per person, so that we can actually. Yes. Cynthia, I just want to give uh, so the people in the back can hear you. You said you have three I've questions. Similar, I've had a similar situation. No gorillas. We haven't had gorillas in Europe for a while, but the community situation. But then you learn that uh, there's le levels, right? The community leaders may be uh, uh, blocking other competitors or impeding licenses. That's the first thing, just a comment. Real quick on the gentleman here. Um, James. James. You know, uh, that's a nightmare scenario. You gotta bring unfair competition and related claims, but in European litigations, uh, just practically when there's no discovery, it's not as easy as here. Very difficult. You don't have witnesses, discovery, depositions, and so forth. Uh, and last, I want to say that the issue of firing people when you can't, and there's severance provisions, that's a big issue. They've done bad things, but now you, you have these strict labor laws. So that's that's my comment. Anyone else? Paul? And then... uh, uh, Chuck, you had mentioned you're dealing with your auditors. Thank you. Uh, Excuse and... me, Paul. We want to make sure that everyone in the back of the room can hear you. Chuck, you had mentioned dealing with your auditors. These investigations take time. When do you disclose to the auditors what factors do you look at because you have confidentiality, uh, you have established all the facts, and let's say it's a, report, a public company and it's reporting, and they, like in the U.S. we have a ten, quarterly 10, 10K and the auditors would like to know this. How do you decide when you're going to disclose? What, what precautions do you take? Okay. So the... Uh... Oh, for the sake of the video, um, we're not going to pass it around. So if anyone else has a question, could you stand up and try to <laughs> speak loudly so everyone can hear? Yeah, uh, Paul raised a very good question, and that is when you're dealing with a public company, you're going to be dealing with the auditors. And the auditors are going to be doing audits for both quarterly or as far as the annual. And also, there could be special times because if something occurs in the organization where there has to be a special report. It's very delicate for we as lawyers conducting an internal investigation on behalf of a public company because we have to coordinate on behalf of the company with the auditors because the company has that obligation of disclosure. So the way we do it to protect confidential information is we disclose facts. So for example, if we were to provide something to the company that has our legal analysis in it, we do not give that to the auditor. It's just simply fact-based. And we do it promptly, and what the auditor is looking for is an end result. What did you do as a result of the allegation? What corrective actions did you take? Maybe you need new policies, new procedures, whatever it might be. You have to satisfy them that the company is now operating with good governance. That's how we deal with it. And as Paul, Paul's question kind of implies, it's an ongoing process. These internal investigations take a long time. You can't do it quickly if you're going to be thorough. So you have this ongoing dialogue with the auditors, with virtual meetings, and they happen maybe weekly or, or, or bi-monthly, but it's frequent. But that's how we deal with it. But thank you, Paul. Any other questions? <laughs> it is lunchtime. I have, a, sorry, hi. I have a question for all of our panelists. Um, and they can pick and choose who wants to or to, to um, answer it. When it comes to conducting an investigation, when you close your file, how do you handle or what do you recommend for a document retention policy? I understand that every country has different expectations and laws. Um, I just want to know what your recommendations are beyond what may be a legal requirement. As a non-lawyer, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start and pass it to you, Santiago, after, if that's okay. Uh, well, I think a lot about uh, source safety, uh, to be honest. I think a lot about uh, 
how electronic information is stored for a long period of time and uh, how uh, governments and hackers might access that information in the future. I think a lot about uh, what the future privacy considerations are going to be of the people that were involved and whether the digital life of the electronic stored information is going to outlast uh, the useful life of, of retention. Uh, and uh, I think that it's very important to, uh, to take a step backward and really uh, try to uh, ask whether the permanence of, of uh, digital uh, footprints is, is now uh, going to threaten um, people beyond whatever remediation is really necessary. We have a client that is a Japanese company in their Colombian operation, and they delete the emails yearly <laughs> and if the employee leaves they delete the emails 30 days after she left so if we have litigation or an investigation six months after one year two years after there is no information and i have not been able to convince them that it is not it is not a legal obligation but it is a common practice to do it better to keep the documents to dip not the documents but the email the documentation. Uh, so, so it is. It is very interesting, very important to have uh, a policy not as the one as this Japanese company has. What is the um, What is the legal requirement for document retention generally for a corporation in Colombia? Ten years. <laughs> document retention. Ten years. And but email is a document. Interesting. Well, thank you, Santiago. Um, as far as kind of advice on the retention uh, of documents, it depends a bit on kind of what we did at the end of the internal investigation. In other words, did the board ask us to disclose the information to the government? If so, we follow the lead of the government, and the government will tell us when not to continue to retain the documents that we have, because most of the relevant documents go to the government. Uh, as, a, as a gentleman uh, asked earlier, and I think his first question dealing with shareholders and the like, there's always the possibility of a shareholder suit. You know, as soon as you have this public disclosure based in the audit, that goes to the shareholders of an organization, they could sue the board and board members for breach of fiduciary duty for not exercising their duty of care to prevent this from happening. So as a result, you have to maintain the documents to be able to defend and address the issues that could arise from that type of a suit. In addition, there could be tax obligations. For example, if you're dealing with a nonprofit organization, and I deal with those at times. You do an internal investigation, um, and you find that officers have misappropriated funds. Well, what do you do with that? You have to disclose that on public tax documents because they're a nonprofit organization. As a result of that, the IRS now is going to impose tax liability on them, you know, as unauthorized individuals to get that money. That's generally a six-year period of time. So, uh, so I guess the question, the answer to the question, Robin, is for me at times it depends mm -hmm. on the results of the investigation. That was your question. Yeah, I, I mean it gets very tricky. And yeah, I it hate to use you as my lawyer, but you know you have a chairman of the board. There's a put option that the minority shareholders have saying, I don't think I'm going to honor that. You know, at a meeting, and now you're like in a situation that's very unusual, right? I mean, it hasn't happened, but there's a threat. So I'm just, there's issues here within issues. Yeah, but I, but I think... Oh, 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 please. I, I was, I was sorry, just going to say... I, to ask no, I, was, I was just going to say, when I do a internal investigation, I'm not representing the parent organization for anything else. Because I could be a witness. My work product is very relevant information. They'll hire other counsel to help defend yes. shareholder yes. suits yes. and the like. And, and that's what I was going to add, is you have to always go back to who is my client? You know, is it the board? Is, it the, is my client the board? Is it the corporation? Is it one of the executives? Who's my client? And at the same time, even if my client says, I don't want you to give a report, if I know this is something that really can end up in the wrong place, I keep my own file. Especially if the board is a majority shareholder. Especially. 
But you have no. But I mean, my opinion though is, and this is my view. Uh, it doesn't matter to me if you, the client is the small, the smaller or the larger shareholder. If there is a potential concern, as a lawyer, that our documents can end up in the courtroom, or the subject of review by a government authority, we should make sure that our files are complete. The best thing that happens is someday they become the source of helping build a fire, like what we're trying to put out here today. At, and at the worst, you have the proof to defend your license. And that's what a lot of this is all about, is doing what's right to protect not just our client, but we don't want to cross the line and then be in our client's shoes and we need to hire lawyers to help us. Thank you. Here are the last comments. Hmm? Here are the last comments. Here. Well, uh, just a quick point about uh, <coughs> document retention. Uh, the, the document retention uh, really depends on uh, the uh, nature of the investigation or nature of the misconduct and, uh, uh, you know, or you need to, you know, or maintain the record of the investigation, uh, you know, or to keep up with, the, uh, let's say, uh, future, uh, you know, cause of action uh, from the government or from the uh, relevant employees. So or basically, uh, you know, or my general recommendation is to think about the statute of limitations on uh, the uh, relevant causes of action, and if there are uh, multiple uh, potential causes of action, uh, you should err on the safer or more conservative side. And uh, you know, one comment, uh, you know, or back to Santiago about the document retention by Japanese companies. Uh, you know, perhaps you know that the Japanese company is very experienced in the international. Uh, you know, transactions, and uh, maybe uh, they wish to make sure that uh, the uh, document should be deleted as soon as possible, uh, you know, based upon their <laughs> experience in the uh, litigation or investigation in the United States. But uh, my general exp experience of dealing with the uh, Japanese company's document retention is, you know, as, uh, as Chuck uh, already mentioned, you know, at the very beginning, uh, we ask the client about, uh, about their uh, document retention or where the documents are stored. And uh, their uh, immediate answer is, well, now everything is in the digital format, uh, and uh, uh, you can find those, you know, all relevant documents in the uh, central server of the headquarters. So why don't you, you know, send uh, a team of the forensic company uh, to our headquarters and to do the forensic investigation? But that's it. But uh, one <laughs> month later, or two months later, they will come back and say, oh, Mr. Sakamoto, by the way, we just found out that you know, there is a big you know, uh, 5,000 boxes of documents stored in the off-site you know, warehouse in a rural area of Japan, like you know, Hokkaido, Kyushu area. Yeah. OK, then why don't we you know, review all of the documents, although they are 20 years old. And the, that is you know, very typical you know, of Japanese companies, not, not in a document retention policy or document retention practice or reality. <laughs> well, I think we've run out of time. If anyone wants to reach anyone on this panel, you can either get a card afterwards or you have our information on the PowerPoint. But I want to thank all of you for your fine attention and for being here. And of course, I want to say thank you to my esteemed colleagues for the great contribution to this program. And to enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great weekend. Thank you. Good job. 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 Good job.
interesting as you know San Diego Chanel, because you know we can look up Gary in Japan. You're my phone. I will tell you the way you brought it together. And oh. I mean, I know Robin. I know Robin for years, and she did a great job of organizing. It really was very coherent, very well put yeah. together. So, here, how are you? How are you? We, uh, we're going to get together. Oh, we're going to do a quick picture. Well, no, we, <laughs> we want Sorry. you in the picture, but not now. I think Robin should be in the middle. Yeah, I agree. Hey, Robin, you should be in the middle. To balance out the two. So I got four.